Well, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, welcome, I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited for tonight, I, I hope you are too. Um, tonight we're gonna talk about the clean energy transition that's already underway. And um, to really go about this, talk about it through, through sort of three lenses. Uh, the first of which is what does that look like for an individual at home? Like how, what is the clean energy future look like for you? And I'm gonna share a bunch of personal journeys along that pathway to make it really concrete. Like this is what, this is what your new home looks like. Um, secondly, like what happens when we, we talk about zooming this all the way out? Like how do you, what does a clean economy look like for the US? Um, and then uh, hopefully you're very excited about these things. And so how do we make this future happen sooner? Um, and what do we need to do to get there? What successes have we already had? Um, and how do we make it all happen? Soon? So um, we're going to cover a lot of ground tonight. Uh, I'm intentionally going to go for kind of a breadth versus uh, depth approach. Um, so I'm going to ask that uh, we save questions for the end. We'll go deep to whatever you want, but to make sure we actually get to the end, um, we'll, we'll kind of keep progressing as we go. Um, Okay, so the first thing I wanna actually do is talk about the US energy system, um, which is responsible for roughly kind of three quarters of uh, emissions and pollution in the US. Um, and what you've got here is a thing called a Sankey flow diagram um, for people that are unfamiliar with it. So it's, it's flows of, of energy coming from the left as they go to do useful things. And there's a whole bunch of things that, you know, get kind of waste energy at the end. Um, you don't have to understand every part of this. We're gonna highlight some pieces just to get the sense of scale. Uh, coincidentally, the US uses about 93 quadrillion brittle British thermal units of energy every year, which is a odd unit, but that's what it is. But it's, it's conveniently very close to 100. So every time you see a number on here, if you like think percentages in your head, it's it's close enough. Um, so when we think about you know the the uh, hydro um, power, like how much hydropower we use, it's about two and a half percent. So um, our energy, you can see, mostly comes from fossil fuels. That's like sort of the Starting at this blue section down, everything here is stuff we burn, um, which represents the majority of the energy we put into the system um, and a smaller amount in these zero emission sources. Um, what do we do with this energy? So first off, uh, a bunch of it's used to create electricity, right? So like it may be that you're burning something to spin a turbine to create electricity, or, you know, in the case of, wind, um, you're spinning things directly, hydro um, or solar, you know, you're just converting electrons directly. Electricity is one big, big uh, thing that we do with kind of primary energy sources. Um, we split the rest of it up kind of into three groups. Uh, one of which is when this, this residential and commercial means buildings, all the things about buildings. Um, some of that is done with electricity, you know, turning, keep the lights on cooling, but also heating, which is why you see a whole lot of natural gas feeding into there. Um, industry, industry is not manufacturing. Industry is how we make the stuff we kind of make other stuff out of. Like how do we make steel and aluminum and fertilizer and concrete um, and a whole host of other things, plastic, laminated wood, carpet, right? Uh, like these, these things. And some of those are, we need energy to make them. And sometimes we actually just use the fossil fuels directly to convert them into these things, like in the case of plastics. Um, and then lastly, transport, right? Uh, every car, bus, plane, train, boat, like truck, how we get around. Um, so there's kind of three big takeaways from this graph uh, to think about. And the first of which is that uh, we need a lot more sources of 
non-emitting energy up here at the top because this is dominated by things we burn to make energy. Um, so definitely like lots more wind and solar for sure, but also probably some other mix of, of hydronuclear geothermal, depending uh, what the what we're able to do. Um, even if we do do that, we get lots more of this stuff. We also need to change the way we consume energy uh, because today we consume a lot of fossil fuels directly and we need to stop doing that. And there, we'll talk about a bunch of the strategies for doing that. And lastly, and honestly, in some ways, most importantly, when you look at this rejected energy chunk over here, all the way on the right in gray um, for people online, um, that's waste. That is like, we did something, went into the system, and that was waste energy. It was heat that was given off that was not used. It was in some other way that we wasted things. Um, fossil fuels are actually really incredibly wasteful when we, we do their energy. You burn it in a wind, in a power generation facility, 50% of that energy is just like withered away, doesn't get turned into useful electricity. If you put gas in your car, only 20% of the energy from that gas burning actually goes into the wheels. The rest of it's just like escaped as heat and pollution. Um, so it actually turns out that as we solve for this, we end up using less overall energy in the process as well, which is kind of kind of neat side effect. Um, so guiding principle for the clean energy transition is super simple, right? We only have to do two things. We have to electrify everything and have everything powered by clean electricity. Simple, right? Done, and I'll go home. Um, what? Yeah, that's, and, and the lecture. Thank you for coming to me. Um, so, right, so the principle is actually pretty simple and like keeping that guiding principle helps like think of through a whole lot of stuff later. Um, and one of the good news is that uh, if you are a homeowner, you can do much of this today. Um, and we largely have. Um, so let's dive in and we'll start on the electricity side, um, which is probably the most straightforward. Um, this is, these are my solar panels. They're not on my roof because I have a lot of trees um, and my roof is not suitable for solar for that reason. Um, they are sitting in a field in Lockinger's. Uh, this is 9D right there. Um, this is the Next Amp Community Solar Array. It was one of the first in the region. Um, it went, went live about three years ago. New York passed a law about five years ago where small power producers, being defined as like two megawatts or less, can <laughs> directly sell their power to uh, consumers in a community subscription model. Um, and what it looks like for you is you sign up with one of these community solar arrays and there's a whole bunch throughout the, the county. Um, and uh, you buy your power from them. They effectively give it to you at about a 10% discount off your central Hudson bill and they pay your central Hudson bill for you. Um, so it's just like a straight up one. You get like 10% lower in your central Hudson bill and your electricity is being sourced from local solar. Um, and the reason they can do that is solar power is so, so cheap. There is an equipment cost to put this in, but when you look at these project lifespans over you know, 20, 25 years, um, it is the cheapest form of energy production that has ever existed for humans. And so they can sell you electricity cheaper than Central Hudson and still be profitable, um, which is a great thing. And what's nice about the community solar subscription, I mean, it, don't get me wrong, if you have solar panels in your house, it's even like more economically beneficial, um, but this is open to anyone who's, who can't for various reasons, um, including that you're a renter, right? You just need a power bill. So, um, so it's great. So knowing our electricity comes from you know, 100% local renewables. Uh, let's talk about the whole electrification process. What does that look like to electrify everything at home? Um, and first we'll get uh, started talking about heat. Um, 
when most of us think about heat from electricity, we think about like heating elements. If you just run enough electricity through a piece of metal, it glows red, heats up, throws heat. Um, that's really straightforward, very simple. It's also actually pretty expensive. Um, and uh, it turns out you can do a lot better than that. Um, through this it almost magical uh, technology called a heat pump. Um, so a heat pump uh, in, does not create heat, it moves it from one place to another. Um, heat pumps typically work in the 300 to 500% efficiency realm, meaning every like one unit of electricity that you put into it, you get three to five units of heat back out of it. Um, this is the same technology that is in your refrigerator, right? Like, what is your refrigerator? It is a this device that lets you make a cold box in the middle of your house, and the back side of it is actually quite hot. Um, and so, what if we use this basic principle and said, you know what? Like, we could make something else cold, like the outside, and we could use the heat instead. Um, and that's a highly efficient mechanism to do so. Um, so our heating is done with a ground source heat pump. Um, so what we've got in our, in our house is a furnace that looks a lot like what our old oil furnace is that we replaced five years ago. It's about the same size and shape. It connects to our, uh, our ducts that existed in our house prior to that. Um, and then it's got a pipe which runs out through our basement wall it uh, goes about 30 feet out from our house, about four feet underground, and then takes a sharp left turn and goes down 500 feet, um, and then comes back up. It's a closed circular loop that's about a thousand feet of two inch pipe. Um, so that's the ground loop. That is where we dump our waste heat in the summer because it's used for cooling. And in the winter, we extract heat from the ground. And one of the great things that is true anywhere on the earth is once you go down about 10 feet, the temperature of the earth is largely constant to whatever the like uh, average surface temperature of like the last 10,000 years was. Um, so here in New York, that's 50 degrees. Um, you get down 10 feet and it's, and it's 50 degrees all the time. Um, so in the winter, we're extracting compressing heat from the loop um, that makes like 100 degree air in the house that runs through the vents. In the summer, we're dumping heat into it and we get like 42 degree air running through our vents uh, in return. Um, we've now done five winters and five summers on this system uh, and it's, it's wondrous. Um, first off, like no more fuel oil. Um, which you know was nice to pull out like the major potential source of carbon monoxide in our house, as well as get rid of super high oil bills. Um, back when we replaced this, we were buying fuel oil at about two dollars a gallon five years ago. That is not where it's at anymore. Um, back then, we were I figured we were saving about eight hundred bucks a year um, with this, and that looks more like two two and a half thousand dollars a year based on current. Uh, fuel oil prices, at least the last time I looked in the spring. Um, I don't look at those numbers anymore. It's great. Um, it's a lot more comfortable. Uh, it turns out you're getting sort of lower temperature heat than you would from burning something. And so the fan runs a little bit longer and pushes the heat uh, to the edges of the house in a much better way. The whole house feels like more evenly heated, which is great. Um, that also means that it's quieter, that fan is running at a lower and more variable speed. Um, so our living room is actually directly over where our furnace is, and it used to be on our old system, like when the furnace would fire up in the winter, we would have to turn off the TV volume. Um, that's not a thing anymore. Um, and uh, indoor air quality actually got noticeably better, right? Like, you know, um, anyone who deals with fuel oil knows that there's like just times when the smell shows up and you're like, Sure, it's not good. I'm breathing that in. Um, so that's all gone. That was wonderful. Um, so this is a big no regrets change for us. Uh, it's cleaner, cheaper, more comfortable. Um, it has almost paid for itself now. Um, probably like two more years at current pricing. 
Um, and that's, you know, this thing should last. Uh, you know, the furnace is good, should be good for about 25 years. The ground loop should be good for 50 to 70 years. So um, it's kind of a long-term investment. Um, so one of our more recent changes uh, was in the kitchen. Um, this is an induction stove. Uh, we got this about a year ago after our old stove, which was it wasn't electric, but it was a resistance stove, came with the house. Um, it decided it didn't particularly want to be an oven anymore. Um, and we had some interesting, spectacular baking fails before we figured out that like this wasn't doing things anymore. Um, so critically, this is not like your electric stove of olden times. Um, what this is, uh, the elements in this are a set of, of pulsed electromagnets. They do not heat up. Um, instead, it's a little bit like a microwave. Um, the magnetic pulses directly vibrate the molecule, the iron molecules in your pans. Um, that energizes your pans. Those molecules, as they vibrate, then directly give off heat inside the pan itself. Um, and that's how you heat things up. So you're energizing the pan. You're not doing the thing that you do, you know, for the last whatever. 100,000 years of human existence, the way we cooked a thing was we made something really hot and we put our other stuff near the hot thing and it got almost as hot as the thing that we were doing. Um, and uh, this goes a little bit different to that. And it feels a little bit like magic. You're like, we're well, cooking with magnets. That's just crazy. Um, but it has a huge set of advantages from cooking technology. First of all, it's really efficient. Um, so, you know, that whole, you're not making something else hot and getting your pan close to that thing and hoping it gets warm. Um, and you're uh, and in doing so, you have a lot less waste heat in the process, right? You don't have an element that's just hot when the pan's not there or a flame going that's heating up your kitchen, um, which is a, a wonderful thing in the summer. There's none of this like, oh, I don't want to cook because like my kitchen's going to become 100 degrees because uh, it's to do that. Um, so directly energizing these pans is so much more efficient. And um, like over an equivalent electric stove, it would be uh, about 40% less energy going into to doing that. Um, it's super responsive, right? You are directly energizing the pan the moment you turn things down two notches, like that energy is not going into the pan and the pan immediately cools down. Um, so all the things that people are like, oh, but my gas stove, I can, it's super responsive, like induction is better. It is more responsive than that. It's really quick. Um, and this is the thing that it takes a little bit of time to get used to is again, because there's no like, no big delays in that, that heating of pans. Like you turn it on um, and I know, listen to a bunch of like professional chefs talking about this. They're like, oh, I turn it on, I throw the garlic in, I go chop something else and the garlic's already burnt because like it's, it's actually warm immediately. Like you have to think about that. Um, but that's also incredibly useful too, because it's very powerful. So um, when you need to boil water, you can kind of do that in 90 seconds. Um, and it has, we had to rethink some of our dinner flows where it's like, oh, we got to put on a pot for corn. Like that no longer takes 20 minutes for that thing to come up to temperature. Like what are, what is the sequence that we have to make everything come out together? Um, and it's also far less polluting, right? So, right, you cook anything, you're gonna give off some like uh, organic compounds, VOCs um, and particulates into the air, like you're cooking. But um, if you're cooking over fire, you're burning something, um, you can never get complete combustion. And so you are also filling your house with carbon monoxide and NOx and other like byproducts um, from either propane or natural gas. So um, that takes all of that out of the equation. Um, the only thing you need to, you know, for this to work, pan has to be magnetic. So like cast iron, 1810, stainless steel, um, you know, honestly, most good cooking ware at this point is we had to replace like three pans at the end of the day uh, before we did this. And if you're curious and you don't want to go whole hog quite yet and get the whole unit, um, 
you can get these induction hot plates for about 50 bucks on Amazon. And uh, I know a lot of people that like, as they've been playing with the transition, they're like, oh, let me get one of those. And they like stick a cutting board on top of their gas stove and they put induction hot plates on top of that and use that. And they're like, oh, this is much nicer. Um, and they can decide, decide later what they want to do. Um, so I know we had some electric car chatter when we first came in. So many folks here will be familiar with this, right? But like transport, um, you know, this used to be much more of a novelty than it was. This is my, uh, this is our Chevy Bolt. It's in the parking lot there. We've had it almost five years now. It's got uh, 55,000 miles on it-ish. Um, I said earlier, right, uh, a gasoline powered car, only about 20% of the energy and from the gasoline as it's burned gets transferred to your wheels. Most of the rest of it goes off as waste heat. Um, electric cars are just like regular cars, uh, except they don't have that, they don't have that drivetrain. Um, so what it means is that the electricity to go an equivalent distance usually runs about a quarter of the price of gasoline. Um, so they're much less, they, they're much cheaper to run. Um, they're magically full every day because you plug them in at your house. And so like, there's none of this thinking of like, oh, do I have to stop and get whatever. Um, doesn't need oil changes or other maintenance for the most part. Um, the maintenance manual on the Chevy Bolt is rotate tires and uh, change the cabin air filter once a year. And then there's something at 150,000 miles. Yeah, fill the windshield wiper. And fill the windshield wiper, yes, yes. Uh, and I think I've replaced the wiper blades once, so thus far as well. Um, so uh, we, we're in a two-car household. Um, we have the 2017 Chevy Bolt. We also have a, an older Super Outback, still runs on gas. We try to do most of our mileage on the Bolt. Um, and the Subaru is kind of reserved when we need more storage, mostly for camping. Um, but, you know, we're probably about two years out from size class matching what we need to replace the Outback with, which is great. Uh, there's one last kind of really exciting thing that comes with electric vehicles, which is um, that starting actually uh, this year with Ford's electric 150, um, they sell equipment with that, which, uh, you know, at the end of the day, an electric car is a big battery on some wheels. That big battery is actually quite big. And uh, it could power your house as backup for like a couple of days um, if you could get the energy back out. Um, most cars today, you cannot do that with. Um, Ford decided to go all in with their F-150 and say like, nope, you can buy a charger that will go both ways. And you just plug your, your, uh, your truck in and then like the power goes out and will automatically flow backwards and, and power your house. Um, and Volkswagen has announced that most of their vehicles are going to have the same uh, functionality as well. I expect it to be pretty, come pretty standard. Um, and especially around here, where like we have power outages that tend to be of order, at least where I am in LaGrange, we have power outages that tend to be of order hours, typically less than a day. This would be like all we needed for our, our backup um, setup. Um, so that expect to see a lot more of that coming actually. Um, and when you just think about like, you know, again, we're like, like heating, you know, the electric version of the thing that we have, um, it's cleaner and it costs less to maintain, it costs less to use. Um, you know, we can electrify everything, um, including all those small motors that you might have in your garage. Um, and, one of the great things about that um, for anyone that's had to maintain a chainsaw over the years, it's electric chainsaws start every single time. Um, God, I hate, like, I, I hate mixed gas and I hate trying to get a two stroke engine to start. So that was just like a glorious, glorious thing when I got electric chainsaw. Um, 
All right, like what did I learn about this, this process of electrifying, you know, largely our whole home? Um, first off, like the clean tech is better tech. It's just like straight up better. Um, and it's always cheaper to run. Like sometimes there's still at this point a premium on purchasing it. Um, it's more expensive to acquire, but like once you've got it, the overhead of using it the way you would expect uh, is less than the fossil fuel alternative. Um, the clean tech has less moving parts. There's just a lot less to break. And so um, ultimately uh, more durable, which is nice. Um, and you will notice air quality improvements uh, pretty quickly in many of these cases. And the thing that I always, always just fascinated me, um, and when I have friends that like are going to, you know, get their first uh, battery electric car or plug-in hybrid, it's like the thing, here's the thing, I'm gonna warn you, about a month into it, you're going to start smelling car exhausts because you do not realize how desensitized you are to it. And then when you pull that out of your life for a while and you get back in situations, like you'll be like, oh, God, this thing smells so bad. Like, what is this? Um, and like, it's been there the whole time and we just got used to it. Um, my daughter, uh, she's now uh, she's almost eight, but I remember a few years ago, we were like going to Adams on like a Sunday morning in like February and gets out of the car and she just immediately holds her nose. And I'm just like, what? And I realized like, yeah, like all of the like, you know, cold weather exhaust was just like, it was a new experience for her. And she's like, why does everything smell so bad? Right, yes. Um, right, so so this is kind of what it looks like in the small. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about how we scale up and it goes in the big. Um, right, same strategy. We're talking about 100% clean electricity, electrify everything. What does that look like economy-wide? Um, so again, we'll just look at sort of the energy breakdown um, and to make sure we hit all these, these spots. Uh, there's five areas that get categorized of where basically the emissions come from in the US. Um, we're not gonna talk about agriculture because that works differently than the others. We'll talk about this other 90%, right? Electricity, um, transport, how we get around. This is buildings minus electricity, which means this is heat and hot water. Um, and then industry again, like how do we make all these things? How do we make steel, how do we make aluminum, plastics, fertilizer, et cetera. Um, and we'll start with electricity. And the big thing to think about, right? Just give a sense of scale about um, how much energy comes into the earth every day largely from the sun, which then often gets converted into other things like the wind. Um, globally, we use 16 terawatts. That's like, that's the input feed that earth needs to keep going. All countries on earth collectively, this is the power draw we're drawing every second, about 16 terawatts. The inbound solar energy is 85,000 terawatts. Now, a bunch of it bounces off the atmosphere, a bunch of it gets used to power the water cycle um, just to heat up in ways that we can't capture. But there is a lot that makes it all the way down to the surface, um, including things, again, right? The sun is what drives the wind. Um, and the important point of this is that there is, there is plenty of this to tap into. We just have to be smart about it. Um, I can't tell you exactly what our future electrical grid's gonna look like, but I'm confident of this. Like it will have a backbone that is largely wind and solar, and we're gonna extend it there with some other technologies to help balance it out well. And the answer, like why do we know that's true? Um, there is so much of that renewable energy to collect. Um, these maps represent, uh, this is the solar potential, darker is better. Um, on red, uh, on the right here. And uh, this blue one is wind potential. Um, again, darker blue is better and includes um, some of the near shelf um, of offshore wind potential. Um, there's a ton of energy to be had. It's just a matter of getting to it. 
Um, and you think about, you know, even like northern states that do have big solar build outs when you talk talking about the southwest or even Mexico, um, it's really impressive how how intense those solar resources are. Um, the big challenge with like we're going to use a lot of solar and a lot of wind, which you absolutely need to do. Again, solar is literally the cheapest way to create energy that humanity has ever figured out. Um, we've never had electricity this cheap ever. Um, but right, like it's pretty obvious that like the sun goes down um, and weather patterns mean the wind's not blowing all the time in any given place. So what we need to add to this mix is some set of balancing technologies. Um, and they kind of come in in four categories. So the first um, is flexible power. Like what are other sources of electricity, other ways we can produce electricity that we could do it a little bit more on demand that we could match with when there's uh, not great access to solar or wind resources. Um, you can also move your, you know, in the middle of the day, right now in the middle of the day in California, they have so much solar capacity that energy prices go negative um, because there's just more electricity generated than anyone can use. They try to export it, like there's just no place for it to go. Um, so what you'd like to do is be able to offset that. And you can do that in like a few ways, right? You know, easy ways to do it. Batteries, right? We all know batteries work. They work on our phone. They work in our cars. Um, so big packs of lithium, um, that would be part of it. But actually, you know, um, we've got multiple pumped hydro storage facilities here in New York where you just say like, hey, when energy is cheap, pump water up a hill. And then when it's expensive or we need it, like let it run back down through a turbine and we can recapture that. And that's got about a 70% like um, round trip efficiency. It's actually, it's actually as good as batteries. Um, and, you know, at some point we might be seeing a bunch of this being done with hydrogen as well. Um, you can also fix this balancing problem just with prep um, where you can put transmission from one place to another. And if you looked at the way that map looked in terms of like, where are the good wind resources? They're in the north and on the edges. And where are the good solar resources? They're kind of in the south. Um, what if we can cross connect some of that? There's actually, uh, you know, great, pretty steady wind out in the plains. If we could get all the way out here, that would be great. Um, there's a uh, high voltage DC transmission line just got approved that'll actually be coming down the Hudson River. That's gonna be um, using hydro from uh, Quebec uh, into New York City, about a gigawatt. Um, and the interesting thing about that is, you know, we'll see how the whole situation evolves, but um, as New York builds a huge amount of offshore wind, um, that there will be times where there's more wind than New York City can consume. And that link will allow that to be sold back north um, to offset in those times. Um, and lastly, uh, there are just ways that you can handle demand needs on the grid. Um, so some of this is efficiency, you know, a more insulated house requires less energy. Let's do more of that. Um, it also means that it's safer when you have a power outage event, like in the winter, because the house just stays warmer by itself passively for longer. And so it's a safety and resilience feature to be, to have a highly efficient home. Um, there's also demand response. And this, we saw this play out uh, very recently in California where, um, you know, they had record breaking heat wave um, and that for a long time this summer, they had a huge drought and then a record breaking heat wave and their hydro resources were down because of it. And they sent out an alert to folks of like, we need everyone to try to turn up the thermostat like four degrees for the next four hours to get us past this. And immediately they got a 5% drop in energy usage throughout the state. And they managed to not have to do any sort of rolling blackouts because of it. Um, this can be coordinated at a lot of different levels. Um, and uh, there's a lot of possibilities there. 
Um, and actually like commercial institutions have this today in a very inefficient way where like, um, you know, the power company will have an a estimate of what the peak power draw is for tomorrow. And in certain times, they will like call up universities the day before and say, hey, can you drop power usage 50%, you know, tomorrow during these hours? And like, then somebody, I mean, typically goes and turns on diesel generators, which is its own problem. But like, um, you can imagine how that could be made a lot more efficient. And we could use that as a pretty, pretty solid balancing tool. Um, buildings, right? So we talked about heat pumps. I showed a ground source heat pump. This is an air source heat pump. Again, heat pumps are just basically magical. Um, I love this, this illustration of how heat pumps work. Uh, explaining like I'm a five-year-old, magical gnomes, grabbing heat, fed by electricity. Um, but we know how to do this. This is this is actually not even new technology. The thing that's new really over the last 15 years is that um, air source heat pumps like this one, this mini split demonstrated here, you can get cold climate ones that are still highly efficient at minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Um, Maine actually has the highest install rate of heat pumps in the country right now, uh, and they, they work in Maine, they work here. This is the biggest thing I have to convince people of, like, it will actually heat your home, I promise. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And the big thing is, um, keep an eye out for that. Now that you know what the outside of a mini split looks like, just like the next time you're driving around, look for them and you will see them everywhere. Um, they were going in first in like restaurants because they were the most efficient way to bring AC and heating into those. And you, restaurants around here started getting these, I don't know, 10 years ago. But now you just drive down a residential street in the way that you would like, oh, now I see solar panels. Like you actually seeing heat pumps all over the place. Um, but just people don't realize that's what they're looking for. Um, Right, transport, transport, uh, we have batteries. We can electrify just about everything. Uh, yeah, it gets tricky on boats and aircraft. Maybe some of those things are not solved problems yet, but the rest of it, right, which represent, you know, 90% of the problem, uh, it's fix it with batteries. Um, you know, maybe we, maybe we have a new age of sale. Um, we'll see. This is actually, this is Michelin prototype. Um, retrofitting inflatable sails onto existing large haul tankers. Um, nothing else about the boat was changed. It drops uh, fuel consumption 20%. Um, the other crazy fact is um, half of all ships that traverse the ocean do so to move fossil fuels. So once we stop needing to do that. Um, actually, a bunch of those ships just go away. Um, so it's a it's an interesting, interesting additional one. Um, industry. All I wanted to really show here is that it is just so many different crazy things um, that we need to build. And some of these, there's path easy pathways to electrification. Some of them there aren't. There's lots of people working on different parts of this. Um, some parts are going to be hard. Um, but you know, we've got technology to do big chunks of it, and we've got a lot of research to figure out how we're doing the rest. Um, there's some companies now, like Steel's finally being cracked about how do you do all electric blast furnaces for steel instead of burning coal, because they still actually need actual coal. So it kind of sucks. Um, and uh, it's a Scandinavian country that's that's been doing some of that. And, I think it was Volvo or Saab is like, please let us buy all of this because we would like to be able to like brand a car that says, you know, all the steel in the car didn't use coal to be made. All right. Um, so there's huge demand to make it happen. Um, all right. So I firmly believe that this clean energy future that we're going to make, like this is inevitable. Like we're going to get there um one way or another because it's cheaper healthier it's more resilient um however there is a really substantial difference 
in, uh, in our overall well being on how fast we make this transition. Um, this visualization is one of my favorite visualizations. Um, this is based on this um, warming stripes uh, concept that Ed Hawkins did, where every, um, every stripe here is a year. Um, and this starts in 1900, and you can see the, the deviation um, over time very dramatically about how uh, things have happened. Um, but oftentimes it's just shown as sort of like, you know, well, this is where we get to. Um, I like this about, about this because it projects forward. Like the future is unwritten, right? Um, there's a lot of different ways we can go. Um, when we were, before the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, we were on this trajectory. Um, we were looking at, uh, you know, three and a half to four degrees centigrade warming by the end of the century. Um, since that, uh, and the agreements that got put in place, um, we are on this trajectory, which is, you know, somewhere dialing in, you know, two and a half to three. Um, if we actually, everyone did the things that they said they were gonna do, all the country pledges were actually enacted. This is what's actually happening by countries and this is what they say they're doing. We would be on this trajectory. Um, we'd like to be down here. This is a future which does not look like the world that we grew up in. It looks like the world now, but it doesn't get worse um, or much worse. And it starts to get better. Um, so this is where we'd like to be. But the important point is like these futures, we made a big change. We can keep pushing um, and make more changes and get ourselves into um, a better place here. And every, you know, every year matters. Um, every tenth of a degree matters in terms of reducing overall suffering. Um, so I would like to bring this future into existence as soon as possible. Um, it's a lot of change. You're talking about changing like big, large systems, but that change is mostly awesome, right? Like cooking with magnets, driving quiet, cheap cars. Um, heating your house with cheap, abundant, renewable electricity. Like these are all, this is an awesome future. We should, uh, we should jump into this as fast as possible. So how do we make this happen? Um, you know, we have to make it first off easier and cheaper to build clean energy. Um, we have to make clean energy much cheaper than dirty energy. Um, we need to ensure there are clean options for everything. Like we've cracked 80% of it, there's still some things to be cracked um, around, you know, flight and uh, shipping and like some of the industrial processes. Um, and we have to make sure that this is a clean future that everyone gets to be a part of. And it's not just for those with the means. Like we have to make this an equitable transition and that people aren't left behind. Because this really can't just be done by you know, individuals being like, oh, that's cool. I could go buy a heat pump, whatever. That's great. Um, but this is beyond individual action, right? We need policy to help make this happen. Um, kind of awesome, since the last time I gave this talk, we have a bit of that. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about what we need to do beyond that. Um, so uh, for the first time since I've been alive, we have major climate policy that was passed in the United States. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 was signed in the law in August. And I want to take a time about what it does, how it's going to work, how we got it, and how we go further. So this is um, the emissions uh, that the U, this is US greenhouse gas emissions. This is not zero down here, just to make sure we we're all set on where the, the bottom axis is. Um, where we've been from 2005 forward. 2005 was the peak uh, emissions year. Um, so this is the trajectory we're basically on until in August, we passed this new bill. And this is the trajectory we're now on. We actually really did change the arc of history. Um, and I went to go back and like, update that last picture because we are on a different path than we were on before, um, which is great. Uh, this is where we told, the US told the world that we would be 
um, in 2030 at the Paris Agreement. Um, you know, if we get really favorable error bars, we're there, but like, you know, the mean for this is, is misses it by probably about 10%. Um, it's 40% below kind of our all time peak. Um, and we had pledged to be at 50% below. So um, how, how does this, this law actually work? And like, how does it get us so much further down that? that curve. Um, it does a number of things, like six main categories. The first of which is um, it has a huge number of tax credits for clean energy sources, wind, solar, um, and it should effectively double America's share of low carbon electricity because of this. Um, that's available at the industrial scale, but also at the homeowner scale. Solar tax credit got extended for 10 years. Um, it also this is the first time these tax credits have been extended for like more than two years at a time. They're all good for 10 years now, which means that there's a whole lot of folks that will get into this market because they can plan around it. Um, Cause they just didn't know, like will it be renewed in December? Um, they don't have to worry about that anymore. There's a methane pollution fee. Um, we talk a lot about carbon dioxide. Methane is actually more potent greenhouse gas. It is what makes up most of natural gas. It's also what cows burp some of, um, but, uh, there is a fee on basically leaks within the natural gas system um, to encourage not just venting all that into the air. Um, that will be huge. Uh, there's tax incentives for electric vehicles, both new and used, which is new, um, which makes them more accessible to more folks. Um, rebates and tax credits to assist homeowners electrifying. That includes like upgrading your electrical panel, um, buying a heat pump, buying a heat pump hot water heater, uh, induction stove, like all those things you can get uh, tax credits for. And depending on income level, um, some of it's like pre-dated uh, for lower income folks. Um, and then funding for some natural kind of solutions and a, a big investment in domestic green manufacturing. There's a whole lot of places where you get bonuses if you are doing the manufacturing for wind turbines, batteries, et cetera, in United States or North America. Um, at the end of the decade, the, this is going to reshape industrial policy in a way that the US will be known as the key cheapest place to buy batteries that power the clean economy in the world. Like we will become a hub for that, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, how did we manage to do this, right? Uh, so if people have been, been paying attention, there have been many attempts over the years of different attempts at addressing climate change in legislation. The last one was the Waxman-Markey climate bill in 2009 that was like two votes away in the Senate from passing um, and then died. Um, actually, even President Clinton um, tried to do a, a B2 energy tax back in the 90s and that didn't pass either. Um, but it turns out um, we learn a lot from past mistakes. So a big part of making this happen is ensuring there was a strong grassroots advocacy around it. So grassroots climate groups like Citizens Climate Lobby that, that I'm a part of got behind the bill and engaged in strong uh, advocacy and lobbying. Um, got a lot of business support for this. Uh, from a whole host of industries. Uh, and even this time, the fossil fuel industry didn't like fight too hard against the bill. They were in the fight, but they, we managed to get some louder voices. Um, public concern about climate change has just massively grown. Awareness has grown. Um, and when we think about the, you know, events of this past few years, these natural disasters we've had that have been fueled by climate change, um, it's just, it's in people's minds, right? You know, like this past week, um, Hurricane Fiona just dumped more rain on Puerto Rico than it has ever seen before. Um, and these things keep happening. And the other thing is that that clean tech actually is came so far down the cost curve that um, convincing everyone like we should just do more of that was no longer like, well, it's going to be too expensive. It's not more too expensive. Solar's the cheapest electricity out there. Um, 
you know, our, our small piece of this, one of many organ climate organizations that helped make this happen, um, was activating volunteers, holding meetings with congressional offices. We did almost a thousand of them last year um, and uh, generate over 200,000 contacts to Congress to help make this happen. Um, so, you know, this is, the level of excitement around this, like, is kind of amazing, right? We literally are in a different arc of history than we were on two months ago. Um, I can't overstate that fact. Um, this bill, this law, I keep having to like remember, it's law now, like we're not still fighting for it, it's law. Um, by accelerating the transition away from dirty fossil fuels towards clean energy, it significantly reduces air pollution. And um, by some of the best experts in the field that have been studying what is the premature death impacts of air pollution, over the next eight years, that's going to um, prevent 180,000 premature deaths from air pollution reduction alone. Um, it also protects uh, against um, the future inflationary pressures that are caused by spikes in fossil fuel prices, um, what economists have been calling fossil inflation at this point. Something like over 40% of direct inflation right now is energy prices, largely driven by some of the global disruption that that sourced off of the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, and what that did to the natural gas markets and, and oil markets and such. Um, and it's a little bit crazy that in like the 21st century of this day and age, um, I'll, you know, what happens halfway across the world like can send the gas, the price of gas here up two dollars like in a couple of months. Um, and that's kind of no way to run an economy when you have no idea what is the price of, of energy going to be two months from now. Um, so it'll help more Americans uh, buy EVs. That will be hugely cost savings. Um, households will be able to save energy thanks to lower electricity costs and moving to heat pumps, um, saving on those. And um, there's rebates for uh, electrification and efficiency in it. Um, the, there's still a lot left to do, uh, right? Like this took us not quite to where we had um, hoped to be for 2030 um, Paris Agreement commitments that we made. And um, there's a lot that still needs to be done uh, to further push us down this curve. And so I just wanna like throw out a few of what those things are. Um, we have to get that last 10% pulled out of there. Um, there's a whole bunch of other ways, additional policies that we could apply to this, including uh, pollution pricing, more electrification, um, and things we can do with natural climate solutions. The other thing is um, the Inflation Reduction Act is a funding bill. It only end up, ends up really happening if uh, local and state agencies, governments, organizations get that money and put it to use. Um, so, you know, keeping an eye out in your communities about ways that you can help um, get these programs deployed um, would be hugely helpful. Um, and that'll just, you know, get us in this green vortex piling down. Um, so, so I'm gonna end here um, and then we'll go to as many questions as we want. Um, you know, final thoughts for tonight. So this is, this is my daughter, Arwen. Um, this here is the Wappingers Creek Green Trail, which is near our house. Um, that is the bridge that used to go over the creek um, that let us do the whole hike that's about two miles long. Um, that bridge is gone now, um, thanks to years of more intense storms. Um, the final thing that took it out was last summer when Hurricane Ida, which was like a trap, it was a category four storm in the Gulf, hit the Gulf, spent three days over land and still had enough power in it to drop five inches of rain here in 24 hours, which took that out and caused catastrophic flooding. I live in town of Grange. Our town lake was destroyed twice last year from catastrophic flooding and they had to rebuild it. Um, the second time they just closed for the season and were like, you know, we'll be back next year. Um, so um, as a parent, I think a lot about what my daughter's life will be like, both while I'm a part of it and after I'm gone. And being part of making this clean 
energy transition happen, both at an individual level, but also you know, systems and policy. That's how we really make this happen for everyone, creating the best possible future for her, um, for us, for everyone else. So um, thank you all for having me tonight. I'm sure there are questions and we'll get into it. I will leave uh, a couple things here. This is my email address. Um, I, if you're interested in uh, getting involved in climate action um, and pushing for more policy, our group, Citizens Climate Lobby, there's this join link there. Um, I'm also gonna send around a clipboard if anyone wants. Give me their email address, I'll get you on our list. You'll hear from me in other times. Um, and with that, thank you, and I will take questions. <laughs>